Amici di Giovedì Scienza, buonasera, grazie di questo applauso. Hello, welcome friends of Giovedì Scienza, Science on a Thursday. Thank you very much for the round of applause. I was particularly pleased about it because Valentina Calda won last year's uh, Giovedì Scienza Prize. It was the second edition then. So I think this round of applause means that you're pleased to see her, pleased to get to know her, and that you appreciate that initiative uh, uh, which tries uh, to recognize younger researchers uh, uh, who wish to communicate or popularize their results. Uh, this is something which is done routinely in other countries. That is to say, researchers have part of their time also to communication of their results. Uh, this is virtually compulsory in some countries. It's part uh, of the uh, description of the job. But it's not yet like that here, but we're working on it. Uh, as um, the Giovedi Scienze Prize shows with the third edition, uh, we are now, our referees, uh, are assessing the work uh, and the projects uh, that have been submitted, about 60 of them, which means that Turin and Piedmont uh, has generated a lot of research. Uh, also, the yearbook, uh, which was recently presented at the Academy of Science, uh, shows uh, that Italian researchers uh, have very high level of productivity, as well as being uh, very far-reaching. But uh, I think it's uh, still one of the areas uh, where we have been able to keep our own, hold our own on an international level, in spite of the enormous difficulties and very limited uh, funding of 1.3% of the GDP, compared to countries that invest uh, two or three times uh, that amount. Um, and so I think that results are quite good. Valentina Cauda was born in Turin. She's very young. She graduated in chemical engineering at the Turin Polytechnic. She then took a PhD in science of materials, uh, science and technology of, of uh, materials, and then went to Madrid and subsequently in Munich in Bavaria. She is in particular involved in uh, nanoparticles and nanotechnologies from various point of view, points of view because you know that nanotechnologies are those technologies uh, which are developing around objects uh, which have a size which is about one billionth of a meter. So we're talking about very small amounts. Uh, take a, a hair and divide it in 100,000 parts and roughly you have the size of a nanoparticle. So this work uh, is a uh, very interesting but covers many different areas and makes it possible to have various applications from medicine to the production of energy and also to the creation of new materials, uh, self-cleaning uh, materials, all sorts of applications, uh, also IT and ITC. This evening we're going to be hearing about some of these applications uh, and the ones which Valentina Cauda is involved in. Her current job uh, since she came back to Italy, is uh, at the Italian Institute of Technology. It's a recently established institute, uh, and it is mainly based in Genoa. And recently, for the past few years, it also has an office here in Turin, or a center here in Turin. This is opposite uh, the entrance of the Polytechnic, or the Turin Polytechnic, uh, and it focuses uh, on a particular area. We'll hear which area in particular. On the whole, one can say that uh, we're working a lot uh, on advanced robotics, um, uh, humanoid robotics, uh, as the term, uh, the current term goes. Uh, maybe it would be nice one day to have, once again, we had it, uh, Cingol We've had Cingolani once before, but it'd be interesting to have Professor Cingolani once again. In any case, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Valentina Cauda. She already has 40 articles published, uh, but she's but a little girl, but a child, so a very big production for such a young person. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I would like to take the advantage for having uh, organized this cycle of conference uh, and for the Giovedi Scienza Prize, which was awarded to me. It was really very beautiful and interesting experience, and I would like to encourage young researchers uh, and people uh, who are scientists um, or even doctoral students or PhD students uh, to take part because it's a very interesting experience but also fun uh, because it taught us a lot, taught me and the other youngsters quite a lot. Um, so I hope uh, that as well as the third edition there will be funds for future editions.
Now, what I will be talking about today is something which I have defined the cunning in nanomaterials. So I study nanomaterials, and in particular, I would like um, to say or answer the question, what are they and what can we do? Nanomaterials are materials, um, so they can be ceramics, metals, uh, they can be plastics, uh, which are more technically are defined polymers, so they can be oxides, carbon. Some of you certainly have, some of you have heard uh, the carbon nanotubes or fullerenes being mentioned. These are all materials, but they're very, very small. Uh, they're nanoscopic, uh, where a nanometer is uh, the unit, uh, and it's uh, one billionth of a meter, 10 to the minus 9. Um, to explain this, uh, I have it here on a scale. The meter is uh, something we are all well acquainted with and that we can see. Then we have the millimeter, and we're going down. Uh, and there's a, I don't know, a grain of sand. Then below that, uh, we have uh, a million times smaller than the meter. We have the micron. A micron, for instance, uh, the diameter of human hair is 150 micron. And it's something that we can still see with the naked eye. While what we can't distinguish anymore, for example, are the diameters of the red blood cells at 10 microns, which means that we're now moving into an area where our senses uh, can no longer perceive them. We need complex instruments and tools uh, to investigate these materials. Um, nanometers are even smaller. So we're one billionth of a meter, for example, a protein is about 10 nanometers according to the type of protein, the diameter of a DNA molecule, which is uh, the building block of our cells, of, of all the living cells, uh, is one uh, nanometer. And below that, uh, we have atoms 0.1. Now, nanomaterials uh, are roughly in this range, which I have now shadowed. By definition, we have nanomaterials uh, that are materials that has at least one of the f three dimensions uh, uh, between one and a hundred nanometers. Uh, you will appreciate the fact uh, that nanomaterials uh, can therefore, since they are very many different materials, can have very many different properties. In particular, they can have properties uh, uh, that macroscopic materials have not. Uh, and today, I will be showing you some of these new properties uh, that have been discovered. Nanomaterials uh, are, well, they already exist uh, because, uh, in fact, the ancient Egyptians uh, were using them, for example, in cosmetics. Uh, because uh, some of those are nanoparticles, so very small. They're present in nature. What we're interested in is uh, how to prepare them. We scientists, uh, researchers, we want to prepare them in the lab so that we can have them with given features or properties uh, because they're going to be then used in certain applications. What we're currently doing in the lab and also in some industries uh, is to optimize uh, the preparation. Uh, we talk about chemical synthesis uh, of nanomaterials uh, or even uh, study new processes processes uh, to prepare them, which will then lead to new nanomaterials so that so far were unknown. And then, lastly, what scientists are working on and are working on a lot is to find applications uh, for nanomaterials, uh, thus making them intelligent or smart, uh, so that these uh, materials can be engineerized uh, or engineered so that they do something specific. Let me just show you here the various forms uh, that they can have. As you can see, there are very many. They can be nanoparticles, something which really hasn't got a shape, or nanospheres, which fall under nanoparticles, nanostars, uh, nanocombs, nanohelixes, uh, roses of the desert. They may also be in tubes uh, or wires. Uh, they can be small sponge-like, nano-sponges, or they can be materials uh, uh, with uh, their multipods. Uh, so I've translated it into Italian as multipodi. Now, these are but a few of the shapes of the nanomaterials. Um, 
Let us not forget uh, that materials uh, can also be of different nature. They can be metal, they can be ceramic, so on and so forth. Then you will realize that the combination between the two generates uh, an infinite well, I number. Well, infinite's a bit of a big word, but a lot of nanomaterials. Uh, a researcher in his or her working life uh, can probably study a couple of these because the, the properties to be studied uh, are very many for every specific one. Today, I will not be talking about all the existing nanomaterials because, uh, first of all, I don't know many of them, uh, but also because they're too many. But I've decided to talk about two particular shapes, uh, which is nanoparticles uh, and nano, uh, well, the nanowires. I'm talking about this because this is my field of research, uh, and I won't be talking about uh, all the other possible applications that nanoparticles and nanowires can have, but I will merely refer to two examples uh, so as uh, to better understand what can be done. Let us start with nanoparticles. Uh, now, I've been involved uh, in nanoparticles uh, in the fight against cancer. Nanoparticles can be used uh, uh, to deliver drugs, uh, anti-cancer drugs, uh, and they can be injected in the bloodstream and also deliver these drugs uh, to the target organ. It is said that the release of this drug is controlled release, uh, that is to say, it happens at a given moment, uh, which is chosen, and uh, on the target organ. So nanoparticles uh, are prepared, and uh, they are loaded uh, and made smart. Uh, smart means uh, that they release the drug when and where you want it to. I'm sh I will be showing you how to make, we decided to try and make these uh, smart. The premise, first of all, is that cancers uh, uh, are unfortunately very common. There are traditional means uh, to fight them, which, for example, like chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, these uh, are very invasive methods. Uh, so we decided to try and work together science of materials and medicine, and this uh, is uh, something uh, that we were talking about before, that is to say nanoparticles, so our crossover studies um, um, to fight uh, cancer and to use uh, these um, delivery systems uh, so that you can release the uh, drug uh, only on the target organ and nowhere else uh, so as to avoid damaging them. What I will be talking about today are uh, the mesoporous silica particles. Mesoporous silica particles are, well, glass, glass as we know it. These particles uh, are made in a lab made and they act as sponges, microscopic or nanoscopic sponges. They're full of pores. The pores are such that they can absorb uh, the molecules of drugs, uh, of the drugs that we're interested in. So one gram of these nanoparticles uh, is able to absorb uh, for 1,000 square meters, which is like a couple of tennis fields or tennis courts. Nanoparticles uh, have a diameter, which is uh, where in between 50 and 100 nanometers. Uh, remember the measurement of uh, in nanometers is one billionth. Uh, and one of the things which is important is all the pores are of equal size. Uh, these uh, pores uh, can be made ad hoc uh, of the size that you wish. Uh, it goes usually from three to eight nanometers. So the scientist who prepares this is able to build the particle that is going to be used to deliver drugs. Within the pores, uh, we can then host uh, uh, these drug molecules. Uh, to do this, uh, it is not enough uh, to absorb the drug. Uh, you also have uh, to take a further step, which is using a molecule that is called a functional molecule. It's simply an arm, an anchor, which on the one 
hand or with the one branch, it holds on to the drug and on the other one to the mesoporous of minor particle. In this image, you can see instead of the drug, we have bound a fluorescent uh, molecule because we needed to see where the molecules went. And in fact, as you will observe, we have managed to store them inside the core of the nanoparticle. Uh, thanks to these chemical groups, uh, to these anchoring molecules, we're able to incorporate drug molecules, uh, which don't necessarily have to be anti-cancer drugs. It depends on the type of application. For instance, um, we carried out experiments uh, where we incorporated ibuprofen. It's, you, you well, you're well aware of what it is. It's an anti-inflammatory, and uh, so it depends on what you want. The drug molecules are hosted within the pore. What happens then? Well, the nanoparticles, once they've been loaded with the drug, have to be injected in the bloodstream so that uh, they can then reach uh, the target organ. Clearly, you cannot uh, inject nanoparticles into the bloodstream as they are because you can well imagine what might happen, the type of inflammatory disease that you would have uh, or reaction if uh, external particles were to be injected in the body because fundamental what they would be uh, either an allergic reaction or they would form clusters of nanoparticles uh, and then thr a thrombus. Uh, this would certainly not be a help. So you have to mask them or hide them and do this uh, so that the nanoparticles uh, will not bother in the body while they're in the bloodstream and that they should not um, decay, but that they should have the right time uh, to reach enough time to reach the target organ. For example, we worked uh, on working on the outside uh, surface, uh, which you can see here in blue, uh, with polymer molecules, which is a plastic material, in particular using this molecule, which uh, is uh, called a PEG molecule. Uh, basically, it uh, makes it possible uh, to, for the particle to be accepted because it's uh, hydrosoluble and it increases biocompatibility. That is to say, the compatibility of the particle with our body. Furthermore, it also uh, impedes or, or stops some clusters, cluster forming within the body. Even better, we worked uh, on decorating the nanoparticle with a molecule which is called heparin. Heparin, and some of you know about it, because normally you get heparin injections uh, under skin when you're in hospital for a few days uh, to avoid the formation of uh, thrombi or clots. So it's natural and it avoids the formation of clots in the blood. So if I coat the nanoparticle with heparin, I am virtually sure that my nanoparticle will be well accepted and that there won't be a reaction that will generate a thrombogenic situation. So on the whole, this problem of the getting the nanoparticle in the bloodstream has been solved. But then the question is, how do I, can I keep the drug within the pores for all the necessary time and then release it if and when I want? Well, that means that the nanoparticles have to have doors. These doors close the pores when we have put the drug in it. These doors, however, must be smart doors because they must remain closed in while the nanoparticle is traveling in the bloodstream and must then open at the right moment, that is to say, when the particle comes in contact uh, with the target organ or target cell. There are, in smart doors, uh, which uh, can be opened with stimuli, which clearly we impart, uh, temperature, pH, uh, or light. In this uh, example, we had developed a door which re reacts to the pH of the solution which it's contained in. Here you can see it's this 
bluish molecule. It's a negative ion. And the new particle here had a positive ion. Positive and negative attract each other. And the molecule closed uh, against the positive ion and maintained the opening of the pore in white here, closed. But this happened uh, when the pH was acid. But when it became neutral, at that point, uh, the positive charge on the ion disappeared, which meant that the door opened because it was the, the negative ion door and the drug was released. But let us now go on to the cell. I called it uh, Troy because uh, it's a Trojan horse. It's a horse uh, that is loaded with drugs uh, and we have to betro well, betray or mislead the cancer so that it will accept the nanoparticle with the drug. The tumor cell or cancer cell is like any other cell, only it's gone mad and the time of reproduction is much higher and it has more resistances so it doesn't die as easily as healthy ones. The walls around the tumor cells are the so-called cell membrane which has a double layer of lipids. It's a double layer, phospholipidic layer. And it is on this cell membrane that we have the information which is necessary uh, to bring in what I have from the outside. It's clearly, the cell only accepts what it thinks is good for it. So what we have to do is that we have to mislead the uh, cell so that it will allow the nanoparticle in. So we decided to coat it uh, with the same layer of uh, lipids uh, uh, that the cell has. Uh, so we cover it with lipids. Uh, it's a compact lipid layer on the surface uh, of our nanoparticle. As a result, we have prepared our Trojan horse. Uh, within the pores, we already have the drug. In this case, it's an anti-tumoral drug. And we have covered the entire particle of these lipids that should mislead the cell. In fact, uh, this uh, double lipidic layer has another function too. Not only does it mask uh, the nanoparticle, but it is also a door. That it means, uh, because it's very compact, uh, it doesn't allow anything out. So in two steps, uh, or in one step, sorry, we had two results. Uh, because as I said, uh, this avoids uh, the drug being released in the bloodstream. Once we prepared the Trojan horse, uh, then uh, we have to give the, we have to overcome the city of Troy. The mechanism whereby you incorporate an external particle within a tumor cell it happens uh, with a process which in biology is known as endocytosis, uh, where the nanoparticle is phagocytated by the cell and the cell then uh, closes its cell membrane, uh, forming a vesicle that you can see here, which is known as endosoma. So here you have a particle with its uh, double layer li of lipids, uh, and then we have uh, the layer of the membrane that is uh, closed up. We tried this in vitro, which meant that we had a culture of uh, cancer cells. In particular, they were liver cancer cells. You can see them in green. This is uh, one cell. This is the nucleus. Uh, and this is, in green, the structure of the tumor cell. And we injected the nanoparticles that you can see marked in red. After a few minutes when incubation started, well, in fact, after 25 minutes, the nanoparticles so, were phagocytated by the cancer cell and they carried out their role releasing the drug inside the cell. It's a very particular drug because it destroys uh, the structure of the cell and it the tumor cell collapsed on itself and died. 
There is a slight problem which I haven't mentioned, and that is to say that the nanoparticle, with all its uh, drug, may not be able to uh, free itself uh, from the vesicle, which means that uh, we need it to explode, literally explode. The Otherwise, uh, the drug cannot be released. So we thought that we could uh, arm the nanoparticle uh, with a bomb. It's a molecule which uh, reacts to light, in this case an ultraviolet one, generates uh, very highly reactive oxygen, which uh, means uh, that uh, both layers of uh, the phospholipids uh, blow up. In this way, the nanoparticle is uh, within the tumor cell without any barriers, and there is nothing stopping the drug from being released from the pores and kill the tumor cell. What? Well, the last step, which is what really hadn't yet happened when I was in Munich, and I'm very pleased because my colleagues who are in Munich have done it in the last year, is uh, to give a, the cell the right to dress. That is to say, when we say, this is what we've prepared you for, this is it, but this is the address where you've got to, be where you've got to deliver the drug. And this is helped by nature because on the surface uh, of uh, their cancer cell, uh, these cells uh, have receptors uh, which combine exclusively with other proteins known as ligands. Uh, there's a sort of uh, key and lock mechanism, which is very specific. So if on the surface of our Trojan hosts we put ligands uh, that are specific for a, that particular tumor cell, then it's as if we were giving the nanoparticle the exact address of delivery. What I've shown you is something which we're currently working on still at a lab level. They still haven't had uh, experiments on animals or nor clinical ones on human beings uh, because we still have to fine tune some of them. And it is also fundamental that the system should be very safe uh, even before, well, before we experimented even on animals. So we expect uh, that a system like this, although it's a very smart one, is uh, still a few years to come. The second topic I would like to talk about, uh, which is the one I'm working on currently at the Italian Institute of Technology here in Turin, and it's uh, this other form of uh, nanomaterials, nanowires. Uh, nanowires um, can be used for a range of applications. Uh, the one I shall be dealing with today is energy. They can, they're power generators. They can be stressed uh, mechanically, for example, with through compression or bending them, and thus generate uh, electricity. Likewise, uh, they can also be exposed uh, to uh, an energy source or a light source like sun, and they can act as photovoltaic cells. Uh, as uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, they're... Uh, productivity level or their yield is uh, still lower than the existing one. So I think it'll be quite a few years before we can replace existing technology. While as uh, power generators with mechanical energy, we're far ahead. Why are these interesting? Why are these materials interesting? Well, because since they're very, very small, they make it possible for us uh, to create very, very small devices uh, that are self-powering. Uh, that is to say, to recover energy from the environment, uh, store it, uh, and use it uh, to power another device. This, uh, these devices, uh, based on nanowires, uh, don't really need much maintenance. They don't need electricity. They don't need a battery. 
So it's a type of energy which is very sustainable and clean. And this is very important uh, in the present day and age. Clearly, we're talking about uh, small-scale energy. We're not talking about, uh, for example, a power station. We're talking about uh, small-scale ones, uh, for example, sensors, uh, which can be implanted. Uh, for example, they're able to read para biomedical parameters uh, such as blood pressure, glucose uh, in somebody suffering from diabetes. Nanorobots, but some of you may have heard about uh, these insects that fly or insect-like devices uh, that are used for military applications uh, or by safe security systems. They can also be systems for domestic uh, security and safety, very small microchips, uh, or they can be, for example, uh, generators uh, of uh, electricity uh, to power portable or wearable uh, electronics, uh, a GPS, a wrist GPS, uh, or Bluetooth transmitter, or the like. So it's certainly worth developing if we wish to be independent of the traditional and free from the traditional energy sources. The material which I'm going to be talking about today is zinc oxide. Zinc oxide, which is also ZNO, as you can see on its identity card, is a crystalline material and it is extremely versatile since it has the ability to generate energy both from the light source and from a mechanical source, but also from the heat sources. It can therefore be used in many ways. It is a semiconductor. Semiconductors are the building blocks of all computer electronics and the chips that we've been using now. It's a piezoelectric, and I will be soon explaining what that means. And it also makes it possible to generate electricity from a visual stimulus. Nanowires have a diameter of 50 to 100 nanometers. You can see them here. You can see it here. They have a length uh, which can be anywhere between uh, 100 nanometers to 250 microns, uh, so they're quite big, not quite visible, but nearly. Again, they're prepared in a lab, uh, which means uh, that they can be customized or tailored uh, for whatever we need. I was mentioning uh, piezoelectricity of the zinc oxide. Um, piezoelectricity is a property which makes it possible to convert, uh, to transform mechanical energy into electricity in zinc oxide. This happens uh, in its atomic structure. I was saying that zinc oxide is a crystalline material and all the atoms uh, are organized uh, in a very particular manner, which is then duplicated in space. You can see with the yellow and gray spheres, uh, and this is the fundamental uh, uh, crystalline structure of zinc oxide. Zinc is at the center, and around it, uh, to the sides of this pyramid, we have uh, four oxygen atoms. Here you can see it displayed in an easier way. In nature, zinc always has a positive charge, while oxygen always has negative charges. In this pyramid-shaped configuration, you can see that the overall charge is uh, neutral. That is to say that the barycenter, the positive charges, which coincide with the zinc atom, is in the same position as uh, the negative charges, uh, which come from the oxygen atoms. Now, if I were to compress, so I squash the material, which on a microscopic scale, the crystalline structure is squashed, I shift the atoms from their position, which also means that I shift the barycenter of the charges, both the positive and the negative, which means that there is an unbalance of charges because we have the positive charges on one side and the negative on the other. This means that we have a differential of potential, which is otherwise known as a polarization. This happens on a microscopic scale, but on the whole material, it's macroscopic, which means that I have a 
positive charge on one side of the material and a negative one on the other. In the nanowire, uh, on the one pole I will have a positive charge and on the other one I will have a negative one. There are two piezoelectric effects that we might mention. One is the direct piezoelectric effect. That is to say, I apply a force and I generate a, a power. I generate power through a p differential potential. But I can also apply a, a, poten a differential potential and create a shift or a deformation, a mechanical deformation of my material. What we will see today is roughly direct piezoelectric effects. So that is to say, I'm going to apply compression a mechan with mechanical force and generate electricity. In this case, we have developed um, some uh, uh, zinc oxide uh, uh, wires which are all aligned as if they were the a brush. And um, you see there are millions and millions and millions of these nano wires, uh, so that at the minimum effort, uh, they all uh, react in the same way. And the amount of electricity that they can generate uh, is already of a few volts. In this case, for example, we had carried out an experiment uh, uh, to have a compression with the finger, and we could generate five volts for every impulse. This makes it possible for us uh, to accumulate uh, this power that was generated and access uh, uh, to or develop energy. And in this case, we use them to power some uh, LEDs, uh, LEDs. Another example that my colleague and I uh, showed in Piazza Castello at the night of the researchers, we mixed uh, the zinc oxide wires uh, with a polymer. Basically, it was uh, a bit like uh, silicon pongo. Uh, yes, a bit like pongo. And uh, we created a composite material with the nanowires that were dispersed uh, within this uh, gummy-like matrix. So we created a material that is very sensitive to pressure. Once you've squashed it, for example, if you connect it uh, with electricity, uh, we can store uh, the p differential and uh, therefore have uh, a, a circle of uh, electricity and electrons. We referred to this material as artificial skin because uh, it's a material that can be shaped uh, as one wishes. And for instance, you could uh, uh, spread it on a very thin membrane so that it could be applied to the surface uh, of uh, a humanoid robot. Um, we're working on this at my center, so it's very interesting if uh, the robot could have a skin that was able to have uh, the uh, touch a bit like humans. In this way, if we apply when the robot is in touch with an object uh, or is touched, uh, you generate uh, electricity because of the principle of piezoelectricity, which I mentioned. This current can then be read by a circuit uh, which other colleagues uh, uh, that are specialists in electronics uh, would prepare, and the reading of this would tell us the intensity, for example, of the pressure on the artificial skin of the robot. Uh, these type of applications, in fact, um, are thought for a robot, but they could also be used uh, for other things, uh, for example, rehabilitation for humans. In another case, uh, we had thought that we might generate uh, this membrane in orange. It's the same um, gummy motrix, uh, rubber motrix, uh, uh, which has a circuit uh, of uh, zinc oxide, and we put it in the soul because we thought that we could uh, use people's walking to generate electricity. So the uh, zinc oxide wires inside this soul would be compressed. Compression generates energy, electricity, which is then stored by circuit, uh, and this would make it possible, for instance, uh, for you to power portable or wearable devices such as a wrist GPS uh, or, for example, recharge your mobile phone or another thing which comes to the mind if you're going up to the mountains uh, and say that I have have no um, power 
and uh, my batteries have run flat. If uh, I have a system like this, I have free energy, which in any case would be generated because I'm walking or hiking, and this means I could power these devices. Uh, what I was saying earlier on is that we could also power sensors uh, able to read my blood pressure or the concentration of glucose in the blood or whatever you're interested in. There's another case uh, which we didn't mention and I would like to mention because I think it's interesting, developed by researchers uh, uh, who are working in Georgia in the United States. Uh, they too are working on zinc oxide. Um, in this case, uh, they've developed one wire, a single wire system, a bit longer than the ones which we use. We're about 100 to 500 microns, uh, which means uh, that it's as big as a hair. You can see it. Uh, and uh, this was uh, placed uh, on a flexible membrane, the green one you can see here, which was in turn electrically connected to a circuit. Uh, this device was then rested on the diaphragm of a rat, and this rat was anesthetized and operated on, and the device was placed on the heart. Researchers observed uh, that, in fact, uh, this generated uh, energy because of the breathing of uh, the rat uh, and uh, the heartbeat uh, deformed the wire, and because of what I said earlier on, this generated power. So they were able to generate uh, small amounts, but uh, clearly we're talking about two millivolts and four picoamperes, because they're very small amounts uh, for every breathing in and breathing out or heartbeat. However, in this case, uh, it was a nanowire. Think uh, what we could do if um, these materials, uh, well, considering these materials are nanoscopic, putting millions and millions of them. In fact, we would be generating amounts of energy uh, which are of a certain amount, and this in itself would make it possible for us uh, to power devices and sensors and the like. Zinc oxide nanogenerators will make it possible for us uh, to recover electricity from the environment. Uh, from the environment means uh, from our body, breathing, blood circulation, heartbeat, uh, as well as movement, uh, walking, uh, and other irregular vibration. For example, they could be used uh, on a car, which um, certainly has its vibrations, and its vibrations uh, could deform the material. So this is why we could say that zinc oxide will make it possible for us uh, uh, to recover energy that in any case is produced, uh, which is uh, produced in a free and sustainable manner, which means that they're worthwhile studying, definitely. Here, well, this is what I think I was important to, to say, and I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much.